Hello, and welcome to Kingdom of Modernism, a talk on 20th century architecture in County Kerry, 1900 to 1980, as part of this year's Architecture Kerry Festival 2021. My name is Peter Luddy. I'm an architecture graduate from Tralee. I have worked and practiced in both Cork and Kerry over recent years. I've also taught architecture history part-time at the Cork Centre for Architecture and Education, where my focus has been on 20th century modernism and housing. I'm excited to share with you an exploration of Kerry's contribution to modern architecture over the next half hour or so. I would like to thank Festival Director Victoria McCarthy for giving me the opportunity to be involved in this year's festival. This is a fantastic schedule of events and hope that you will all enjoy this celebration of Kerry's built environment. The wealth of architectural heritage in County Kerry spans many centuries and offers an important reflection on the social, economic and cultural history of this place and its people. The many ring forts, monastic sites, churches, castles and estate houses dotted around the county, monuments to our earliest history, are undoubtedly Kerry's most renowned landmarks. As a result, however, our more recent architectural history, that of the 20th century, is often overlooked. Yet, the buildings of this period are perhaps most significant in telling the story of our relatively young nation. As the centenary of the foundation of the Irish state approaches, it is important to acknowledge what contribution Kerry's modern architecture made to this formative period. Using this local lens, we can review what was happening more broadly on a national and global level and explore the great innovation and experimentation that occurred in design and construction during the 20th century. I will begin by setting the scene and briefly examine the societal and political conditions that emerged at the turn of the century and which modern architecture reacted against. Influenced by British fashions, Irish architecture in the 19th century was dominated by historicism. Take, for example, the purity, order and symmetry of William Vitruvius Morrison's neoclassical Tralee Courthouse from 1834, or the more fanciful, irregular composition of St. Mary's Cathedral Clarny, designed in the Gothic Revival by Augustus Pugin in 1840. Although there were some brick buildings in Kerry's most prosperous towns, stone masonry was a material of choice, owing to its severe character and monumentality. Limestone, red sandstone and slate were all available locally. Though occasionally used to steel and wrought iron was confined to industrial infrastructural works. Civic buildings like post offices, banks, courthouses and jails sprang up across the county. The expanding power of religious institutions was reflected in the ambitious erection of convents, seminaries and churches. Meanwhile, the elaborate country homes of the gentry and the grand townhouses of the merchant class stood in stark contrast with the simple thatch and rubble stone cottages or behawns of the masses. The 1800s was a tumultuous time, seen radical and rapid change globally in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. Technological advancements and the mechanisation of labour had increased production and efficiency, but eroded the rural way of life. Towns and cities expanded outwards like never before. Humanity moved firmly towards an urban existence and the age of the machine. Yet, Kerry's edge location away from Europe meant these new ideas and advancements were absorbed slowly. There is limited evidence of any significant industry, and the county remained largely dependent on its agrarian economy. However, widespread death and emigration during the Great Famine set in motion a dramatic contraction in the county's population. With the census noting the decline of 135,000 people between 1841 and 1911. Rural migrants were driven towards the county's urban centres in search of greater opportunities and prosperity. Despite economic progress, the headlong rush for modernisation had not yet solved the inherent inequality in society. In 1867, for example, 75% of the land area in Kerry was in the hands of only 26 landowners. Rural dwellers had few employment prospects and often led a subsistence existence. Urban workers also suffered as localised population booms led to overcrowding, pollution, squalor and disease. Literacy, child labour and exploitation were also commonplace. Kerry's cramped workhouses bore witness to the county's endemic poverty. Ultimately, 
the magnification of society's ills provoked a profound conscious response. Echoing the spirit of progress seen in science and industry, new ways of thinking would reform worldviews on economics, religion, housing and education, shifting the social landscape globally and here in Kerry. The upheaval in society was mirrored by spatial change as buildings responded to the evolving requirements of the modernising world. Modern architecture broke from the authority of tradition and aspired to reflect the spirit of the time rather than simply recalling the past. Modernism came to be defined by an analytical approach to the function of buildings, a strictly rational use of materials and technologies, an openness to structural innovation, and the elimination of ornament. Emerging at the turn of the century, it reached its zenith following World War II, but continued to flourish until the 1980s. As we now turn our attention to examples of modern architecture in Kerry, I will endeavour to describe these buildings and structures in their original state of completion and embed us in a sense of the time. The beginning of the century was defined by the rising tide of opposition against British occupation and the push for self-governance. The surge of nationalism was also felt in a wider cultural revival as the formation of groups like Conor na Gaeilge and the GAA awakened a renewed sense of Ireland's ancient and distinct identity. Kerry's commercial architecture in particular mirrored the political, and the shop fronts of the Stoll became sites of contestation in the battle for a national identity. Irish architecture, diluted by a British perspective, remained largely indebted to historical styles in the early decades of the new century. The red brick and fine limestone detailing of the AIB Bank at 38 the Square of the Stoll from 1910 is typical of the Queen Anne revival, fashionable across Britain at the time. Contrasting with these foreign influences was a conscious effort to de-anglicise Ireland. Inspiration was found in the vernacular or traditional culture, and indigenous motifs, often derived from the Celtic revival, recreated the romantic glory of Ireland's past. This spirit of national romanticism materialised throughout Europe in the 20th century, is evident here in Kerry in the decorative plasterwork of Pat McAuliffe on the pub and shop fronts of the Stoll. In 1906, McAuliffe crafted a political allegory out of stucco upon the facade of the Stoll's post office, the three-storey Emporium building at 15 Church Street. Representations of an American eagle, or phoenix, and two mythical pegasi with delicately articulated wings appear to take flight above a sunburst carved into the parapet. The Latin motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one, is inscribed below them. Further winged animals are scattered across Lime Surrender Scrolls and Celtic Knotwork, which frame the shop front. This fluid and dynamic composition richly expressed a new Ireland rising from the horizon of colonialism, an ideology which would be clear to all those who frequented this public building. McCall's renovation of the Central Hotel at 12 Main Street from 1912 illustrates even more overt nationalism. A plaster embellishment above the public house features Erin, a robust woman in Celtic attire and the female personification of Ireland. She wields a harp and a wolfhound and a round tower lie alongside her, as symbols of refuge and protection from the foreign invader. The mass of plaster at her feet bears the phrase Erin Gabroch, Ireland forever and the prospect of a new dawn rises behind her. The exuberant chromatic approach to this piece illustrates a playful refusal of the classic aesthetic. Moulded off-site at McCall's workshop, it was later hung from the stone facade with cement and metal brackets. The Maid of Erin has an almost monumental presence at the entrance to the town square and is regarded as McCall's most well-known work. McCall's compositions reign firmly within the realm of ornamentation. Unlike historical styles, however, his decoration expressed a vision of a future rather than simply evoking the past. The immediate political commentary of this work captured the growing embitterment of the local community here in Kerry. McAuliffe's nationalist propaganda was rendered physical during the War of Independence. The destruction of symbols of colonial rule, such as the RSC barracks and Amiskal, a Ballyhide castle, had suggested a violent separation from the old political order and from its outdated styles. Control over the national architectural agenda lay firmly in the grasp of a newly independent Ireland. However, the outer world was still reading from international conflict and economic depression, and the Irish Free State, in its infancy, had limited financial resources. Therefore, 
The holding operation of the Commonwealth government opted for prudence rather than risk experimentation. Local and urban government enjoyed increased powers after independence. In a deliberate and physical statement on the transfer of power, the seat of Kerry's local authority was relocated to the old Denny landlord's domain. Kerry County Hall, later dedicated as Ash Memorial Hall, was one of the country's first and few new civic buildings. Funded by British reparations, it was constructed between 1924 and 1928 by John Kenny and Sons, to the designs of T.J. Cullen. The square plan of the building accommodated a perimeter of offices around a central well which contained a public theatre and cinema. The material language and elevational composition of this 13 bay building emphasises the tentative architectural approach of the Free State. Walls of snecked or regularly cut blocks of actual sandstone celebrate local masonry techniques and echo traditional monolithic use of stone to convey severity and strength in public buildings. The building was designed to be seen in the round, and the four facades adhere to the symmetry and order of classical architecture. A deep plinth and channel stonework base roots the building in the site. A horizontal band or string course creates a new datum line. The flush walls and double height windows at the upper levels are elevated above this basement. Finally, a cornice projects from the parapet overhead, enclosing the hipped roof. Five bays of pilasters and entablature form a monumental entrance which protrudes from the northern elevation. Molded stone sills and surrounds frame the central doorway and key openings. Approached by a set of concrete steps with candelabra piers, this facade addresses the heart of the town and terminates the vista at the end of George and Denny Street. Despite its classical tendencies, Kerry County Hall contains some modernist touches. The material excess of the past was abandoned as ornamentation was reduced or muted to form sharp and clean lines across the building's facades. Influenced by the Austrian architect Adolf Luce's writings on ornamented crime, this stripped back aesthetic would become more prevalent as the century progressed. Having secured the mandate in the 1932 election, De Valera's Fianna Fáil party resolved to transform Ireland into a self-sufficient bucolic Gaelic utopia. Architecture offered the means to realise this, and the 1930s witnessed an ambitious and extensive building programme. However, the outbreak of World War II and the scarcity and rationing of the emergency halted progress considerably. Construction slowed down to a trickle, and the economy remained in a fragile state throughout the 1940s. Ireland's neutrality in the conflict also initiated a period of international isolation, which only benefited conservative practices. A primary concern for the state was the upgrade of the nation's communication and infrastructure network, improving access to rural areas. In March 1932, the wrought iron suspension bridge across the Kenmare Sound was demolished for fear of collapse. This marvel of 19th century engineering would require a suitable replacement. Still dependent on outsourced technical knowledge, Kerry County Council appointed London-based engineers LG Mushill and Partners and contractors A.E. Farr to the project. However, prominent Irish civil engineers Pierce Purcell and Cornelius J. Buckley provided consultation, and the labour force was sourced locally. Much of the work was carried out by hand and without planned assistance, greatly reducing costs. The new proposal saw a double span bridge built across the estuary, incorporating existing stone piers to carry the replacement structure and road deck. The largest public work project undertaken thus far construction of the Shannon Hydroelectric Scheme at Orna Crusha, had awoken the state to the possibility that Ireland, a cement-rich country, could become self-sufficient in the production of concrete. This is also reflected in the pioneering use of concrete at the new Kenmare Bridge. The concrete was cast in situ and reinforced to form the arches, secondary ribs and beams which support the carriageway. Wrought iron handrails with a crisscrossing pattern, manufactured by Ireland's Shannon Foundry Limited, provided protection for pedestrians. This construction took on a striking outline as two 150-foot parabolic arches leapt from shore to shore, passing through the road deck. When it opened on 25th of March 1933, Kenmare held claim to one of the largest concrete bridges built in both Britain and Ireland. Financed by the Irish Hospital Sweepstakes, the government also proceeded with a major overhaul of the country's health services. 
This included the construction of a new 20-bed district and fever hospital in Listowel, designed by John J. Winters between 1933 and 1941. Although the building looks sterile and spartan by today's standards, it followed contemporary trends in medical design. Society had awoken to the benefits of clean, well-lit and properly ventilated environments for physical and mental well-being. New architecture would be executed on a scientific basis, with emphasis on function rather than form. Non-essentials were stripped away to maximise space and efficiency. The dusty clutter of ornamentation was replaced by the minimal, plain surfaces and organisational clarity of modernism. This clinical, utilitarian aesthetic also perhaps reflected de Valera's rigid vision of Irish society. However, it simply suited the impoverished functionalism under which the country's hospitals were operating. Rationing and material shortages during World War II meant that the Listowel project was completed with great difficulty in June 1941. The hospital's distinctive gate lodge presents a more positive image of modernism. A pair of fluted pilasters supports a thin concrete canopy which follows the curvature of the low, flat roof building, sheltering door and window openings. A porthole window recalls the sleek, rational design of a cruise liner, a recurring theme of the modern industrial aesthetic which glorified the machine. The abstract geometry and universal quality of modern hospital buildings helped to spread the language of modernism throughout the country. The eventual completion of the stole and other facilities proved timely as Ireland weathered a TB epidemic in the late 1940s. The mid-century was characterised by the hardships of recession, austerity and immigration. These lean years ultimately proved fruitful, however, as aspiring architects returned home later in the decade, earned with valuable experience and determination. The culture and solarity of the previous decade was swept away, and Irish architecture began to engage more openly with the modern movement in Europe and America. Housing remained an imperative for the government of the day. The 1946 census had indicated that some 80,000 people still lived in single-room dwellings across Ireland, and tenements were common in urban centres. There were on the streets around Butchers Lane, Mary and Abbey Street, in Tralee, typified slum conditions. A tremendous sense of neighbourliness and community could not disguise the Abbey's overt dereliction and poverty. Overcrowding was further compounded by poor sanitary facilities and an inadequate water supply. The 1948 general election results reflected voter dissatisfaction with Fianna Fáil's housing policy. The succeeding inter-party government responded by passing a new Housing Act. It had immediate effect. Poor areas such as the Abbey began to be demolished during the 1950s and the residents were gradually rehoused. The Act also provided increased subsidies for purpose-built local authority housing on the edges of towns. One of Kerry's most significant new residential estates was a 259-unit development at St. Brennan's Park in Trudy. Aimed at the higher end of the rental market, for those with fixed incomes, it reflected a new trend of suburban living. It drew on some principles of the Garden City movement popularised by the urban planner Ebenezer Howard at the turn of the century. The open and flat site along the Abidoni Road was surrounded by swathes of agricultural land and a wide tree and grass verge lined avenue from the primary approach into the heart of the estate. Furthermore, each house had its own back garden, which encouraged the growing of fruit and vegetables and encouraged self-sufficiency. Some also had open front lawns, while others faced onto squares of shared green space or parkland. A major feature of the state was the central radial junction and the interconnected circulation routes, which fostered a sense of community. This suburban organisation allowed the bright and airy surroundings of the countryside to seep into the urban environment. The estate comprised primarily of three bed terraces, but also included a number of semi detached and bungalow units. These were comfortable and modern homes, dual or triple aspect, with double height windows to stairwells and open plan living and dining spaces. The elevational compositions of the scheme reflect a great variety of house layouts. Mid terraced homes feature a mix of individual archways or paired entryways. These open, covered spaces provide storage for fuel and double door access to the rear gardens. End of terrace units with side entry through small arches into the chimney stack help to turn corners. Meanwhile, feature bungalows and three distinct sets of semi-detached units had oversized, almost monumental gable-ended fronts, 
terminating end of street views. Two grocery store homes at the site's entrance, a later addition, has similar triangular profiles with ribbon windows above a central archway. These playful elements enliven the simple material palette of rough cast plaster and metal windows with rendered or brick accented surrounds to openings and thin concrete projections. St. Brendan's Park was a landmark experiment in council housing in Kerry, and its distinct architectural quality is still evident today. Later council efforts were compromised in design variety to provide simpler estates at reduced costs. The gradual introduction of free national school education had seen more than 200 such schools built in Kerry by 1911. The eager patronage of religious institutions resulted in a largely conservative architectural approach and many schools adopted a vernacular or parochial aesthetic. Basil and Raymond Boyd Barrett's appointment as the Office of Public Works Chief Schools Architect in 1947 saw a significant move away from those traditional school designs. Modernism had embraced the speed, efficiency and modularity of the assembly line, and Boyd Barrett's rational constructions drew from a similar kit of parts. Each school adhered to minimum national standards in terms of dimensions and detailing, but the flexible arrangement of these parts, in response to the specifics of site and context, would allow for much greater variety in school plans. This universal design method was quickly rolled out across the country. The Church of Ireland School at Arabella Barry McElligot is an early example of Boyd Barrett's approach in a rural setting. This small, L-shaped school was built between 1952 and 1955 and catered for 40 pupils in a single desegregated classroom. Facing the road, a portico of circular columns extends beyond the central entrance to form a canopy over a play shelter and fuel store. A double height classroom rises to the rear, breaking from the low horizontal arrangement of this service block. The flat roof here is atypical of the later OPW prototype, which favour pitched trusses and clear story glazing. Clear consideration is given to the comfort, health and hygiene of staff and students at Ballymac. A set of three oversized sash windows face south, fitting a classroom with adequate light and air, while a traditional stove provides heat in winter. A freestanding water tower and indoor plumbing also facilitated the modern convenience of integrated toilets within the building. Boyd Barrett's iconic towers remain a recognisable feature in the Irish landscape today. Red brick piers and integrated planters frame Bally Mac's main entrance, contrasting with the otherwise simple palette of concrete and rough cast or rendered masonry walls. The use of concrete had become even more widespread in response to post-war material shortages. In block and render form, it lends itself to modular construction and the stripped down aesthetic of the modern age. That the abandoned school at Bally Mac remains intact today is testament to the quality of its construction. Ireland's economic fortunes witnessed a dramatic turnaround in the 1960s under the leadership of Sean Amass and T.J. Whitaker. Emigration slowed as foreign industry and investment was attracted to these shores. The expansion of the economy reflected a new confidence and determination as Ireland transitioned from a culture of tradition to a culture of progress. Crucially, it distinguished modernization for anglicization and looked towards the continent for inspiration. This political and economic transition would be echoed by architectural transformation and the ground was prepared for a building boom. Kerry benefited hugely from an influx of semi-state and foreign investment with the opening of ESB power plants in Tarbert and Kersaline and the arrival of the Lieber Manufacturing Complex in Clarny. This international spirit is echoed in the aesthetic of these ultra-modern buildings which celebrate the aesthetic of industry and the machine. However, these industries were also conscious patrons and the 1960s and 70s also saw the construction of a number of housing schemes for their workers. It is also worth briefly noting how the economic changes in Irish society impacted the hospitality sector as a more egalitarian form of tourism opened up for the masses. Sam Stevenson, one of Ireland's most public architectural figures, designed a number of new landmark hotels in Kerry during this era, including the Mount Brandon, the Skellig and the Clarny Rhine. However, perhaps the most remarkable change occurred in ecclesiastical architecture. The Irish Catholic Church had opposed the pagan and foreign values of modernism 
and continually encouraged imitation of 19th century Gothic landmarks like St. Mary's Cathedral. The 1950s had seen a softening of hostilities. An extensive church building program by Cork architect J.R. Boyd Barrett saw 10 new churches built for the Cary Diocese between 1951 and 1961. New builds including Our Lady of Perpetual Succor in Shrone, the Church of the Sacred Heart in Larga Pawn, and the larger St. Mary's Assumption Moy Van. Held on to traditional rectangular layouts, but embraced concrete frame construction and exhibited a gradual acceptance of simpler, less ornate forms. Further revolution was on the horizon. The Second Vatican Council of 1962 to 1965 readdressed the Church's relationship with the modern world, proposing reforms to religious rituals and environments. These included more democratic sacraments, which encouraged participation of the laity in communal worship, the acceptance of contemporary styles in sacred art, and the promotion of humility over materialism. The constraints of tradition gave way to bold experimentation and striking variety in design, driven by the architect's vision as much as by church directive. Some of Ireland's most renowned modern churches were completed in Kerry during this period of liberation, including Michael Scott and Ronald Tallon's Corpus Christi Nakanur from 1964, and Lee McCormick's Prince of Peace Fossa from 1977. I want to focus, however, on a pair of churches by the native office of DJ Kennedy and Company. St. Bernard's Abbey from 1968 and Our Lady of St. Brendan's Tralee from 1970. While St. Bernard's replaced an older church, Our Lady and St. Brendan's accommodated Tralee's expanding suburbs. Funding was raised within the parish communities. St. Brendan's, the larger of the two, cost in excess of 114,000 pounds or 2 million euro in today's money. Kennedy collaborated with local contractors Fitzgerald Brothers and Morris Walsh, a structural engineer from Cork, to realise his visions. Both churches broke from the rigidity of traditional arrangements. St. Bernard's asymmetrical L-shape broadens and staggers outwards towards its chancel and sacristy, with off-centre entrances on each end of the L. St. Brendan's adheres to symmetry, but experiments with a more fluid diamond-shaped pattern. Its main entrance is placed diagonally opposite the altar, while a chapel and sacristy protrude on either flank to form sheltered side entrances. Kennedy's churches have strikingly modern roofscapes, finished in light prefabricated copper panelling. Abidorney's five tent like peaks rise to a spire above the nave, with step flat roofed aisles and annexes falling on either side. The structural acrobatics underpinning this are revealed in a grid of six splayed piers around the central nave carrying a steel portal frame and the pitched timber sections above. Tralee Church has a more coherent form, uniting the parish under a single large roof. This expansive metal structure converges to a sharp ridge line, subsuming the spire into a canopy above the main entrance. The supporting cruciform concrete columns are pushed to the periphery, and the white spamming beams above facilitate a spacious interior. Embracing Vatican II reforms, Kennedy's designs dismantle the physical and psychological barriers to participation. Communion rails and pulpits were removed, and the priest turned to face his community. St. Brendan's open plan in particular permitted a flexible altar arrangement on a low podium, with four sections of pews radiating out from the sanctuary, granting unimpeded views for a congregation of 950 people. The church's shared raw material palette reflected Vatican II's calls for noble simplicity. Ceilings are panelled in Colombian pine, while cement brick face walls, granite thresholds, and narrow timber frame windows fill the space between the exposed concrete columns. Light floods into these lofty, bright spaces through clear story glazing beneath the roof soffits. Commissions by Irish artists decorate these spaces, exhibiting the church's adoption of contemporary art. Brother Benedict Tully contributed a number of items, including the polished black Galway limestone font and the filigreed copper and liquor glass crucifix which floats above the altar at Abbey Dorney. Copper also features heavily in Patrick McElroy's minimalist analysis and Imogene Stewart's Marian statue in the Isles of St. Brendan's. 
The focal point of the Trudy Church was a simple punched granite pedestal by Ray Carroll and Paddy Rowe. Meanwhile, the clear story glazing above features abstracted representations of the church's patrons in richly coloured stained glass by Murphy Devitt Studios. Kennedy's churches are described as examples of international style, an aesthetic celebrated for its universal application regardless of context. An October 1970 edition of the Carryman describes the sharp lines and angles of the newly complete St. Brendan's as reminiscent of a pagoda. This suggests the arrival of something alien and new. However, this newcomer found his feet with subtle references to familiar and local. Canon Pat Horgan suggests that the church resembled a group of fishermen carrying their upturned cork out to sea. And, by accident or by design, its ridgeline points towards the peak of Mount Brandon on the horizon. This break from outright internationalism reflects the new symbolism and contextual sensitivity that emerged in architecture as the 1970s drew to a close. This iconic photo captures the destruction of the Pruitt Ego housing scheme in St. Louis, Missouri in July 1972, a moment which provoked theorist Charles Jenks to proclaim the death of modern architecture. Just as modernism had engineered a radical shift at the turn of the 19th century, a new generation of architects would question and challenge the status quo in the late 20th century. For all its innovation, modernism's utopian principle of universality was ultimately to its detriment with a sense of dislocation and antisocial environments particularly evident in the unsuccessful mass housing schemes it had popularised. Living in the now did not mean future-proof, and many 20th century buildings have undergone necessary renovation and alteration in recent decades. The successive, postmodern, and critically regional architecture that emerged in the 1970s and 80s reacted against these failings and witnessed a revival of interest in history, context, and culture. It sought variety and a sense of truth to place rather than time. The sensibility of this mature architecture suited the landscape of Kerry and led to many fine buildings at the turn of the 21st century. But that is perhaps a story for another day. Just as Kerry's ancient landmarks remain as tangible markers of its earlier history, the buildings of the 20th century have the capacity to illustrate the society and culture of our modern times. I hope that this brief journey into the period has succeeded in awakening a deeper awareness and appreciation of the modern heritage just around us, here in this little corner of Ireland.